So before I dive into the interview, uh, I wanted to show you this picture quickly because um, I saw you guys at a gig at the Half Moon in Putney. It was a Wolf Cub gig. Yeah. I was, I would have been 13 years old, I think, when I came to see you guys. But I found this picture. I don't know if you can see it, but yeah, that's me with you guys at the Half Moon. <laughs> oh my God, you look, well, obviously you look 13. Yeah. I remember that gig very well because we hadn't like done any promotion for it. It was for our third album. And we'd been away for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember we had, <laughs> I remember A, I didn't have a shirt. So that shirt, which I'm wearing there is actually my tour managers. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, I, I remember that really clearly actually. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that was the first time I would have heard Rains in LA and Summertime in the City and all of those tracks and really, really enjoyed them. I wanted to start the interview by talking about the beginning. So how did you guys meet? You were kids, right? We were kids. So I met uh, Pete. I met, we were in Cubs together when we were five. Okay. Uh, well, I, w I would have probably been six or seven. He would have been five. And Greg, I met on the first day of school when I was 11, secondary okay. school. Uh, so we've been, we were friends for about, well, with Pete, I was friends with him for like 10, 12 years before we even started playing music together. Okay. Uh, and same with Greg, we were friends. We were like deeply uncool kids at school. And uh, that Greg always had a girl, I don't know how, he always had a girlfriend, like even when he was like 11. <laughs> but uh, he, we, like we used to hang around the quiet green. That's yeah. how, that's how rock and roll we were. And it, the quiet green was on the way to the music rooms. And one day there was this drum kit being taken across the quiet grain. We, we, there was no drum kit in the school before. And we, suddenly we thought maybe that is our route to, to coolness. And we signed up for drum lessons straight away. We were probably about the same age as you were in that photograph, like 12 yeah. or 13. And uh, it started from there, really. Yeah, cool. And were you in any bands before Scouting for Girls came about? Were you in the bands together or on your own? We were, we were in bands together all the way before. Like it took us... We started making music together when I was 15. Uh, and that's when I pick, really picked up a guitar. And because I, I didn't have any lessons, I just started writing my own songs mm -hmm. rather than playing other people's. Because I, not because I was a great songwriter, it was just I was a terrible guitarist and I couldn't play other people's songs. So I started doing that. Uh, then I convinced Greg to buy a guitar as well. Uh, I didn't really know, like Pete was just like a younger friend in the Scouts or the Cubs. You yeah. Know? So I didn't even, I didn't even know he was playing the drums until a bit later. But me and Greg started playing guitar together, started drum lessons together, then started playing guitar around sort of fifteen, and then, uh, you know, it was Britpop, so it was Blur and Oasis and yeah. Pulp. It was like the mid '90s was a really exciting time for music. It was, it was in, like, it was such. But if you like guitar music and through that guitar music, I'd sort of discovered the Stones and the Beatles and because all those bands were like uh, influenced by them. So it was an amazing type of music. We went to our first ever gigs, like went to see Suede and everyone was like, you know, in a mosh pit and uh, guitar music was so cool. So we formed a guitar band and then only 12 years later, <laughs> through different name changes, we, we signed a record deal. So uh, yeah. we weren't particularly good, but it was more... You know, we did it because just because we loved it and we loved hanging out as friends, really. And where did the name come from? The name came from, uh, well, because me and Pete were in the Scouts together and mm -hmm. we were quite, we were quite hard. Like, I was a leader for the, because I'd have been in my 20s when we came up with the name and I was a leader of the older section for like 14 to 18 year olds, yeah. which I really loved. It was really like, uh, I still think now it was one of the, uh, your proudest achievement still? Well, I'm not so much a proudest <laughs> achievement, but it, it was like, I've got some amazing memories. And uh, 
I kind of stopped that once the ban took off, you know, just because we were so busy, I didn't really do anything about like in my life about giving back, but it gave me an enormous sense of like fulfillment and satisfaction, you know, helping, you know, young kids do fun stuff and, uh, you know, outdoor activities and things like that. But yeah, so the name that Scouts was formed with a, a book called Scout for Boys, which was written by Baden Powell a hundred years ago. And I thought Scout for Girls was a really clever, funny name. Like it's, it has served us well, but I kind of think the way the world's going, we'll probably have to change our name to SFG or something, yeah. especially as we're getting older. Like we never, we never thought we'd get a record deal. We never thought we'd be famous. We never like, it was just like a fun thing we did. And our friends came and, you know, sung along to the gigs we put on in, in Harrow. It was, uh, it was, uh, yeah, we never, I would have probably chosen a different name. To be mm -hmm. And what was the first Scouting for Girls song that you ever wrote? I in one ways, it was keep on walking. It's been three weeks since I got a decent sleep. I have a restless head and an empty bed. These dreams are killing me so. I keep on walking till the sun comes up. I keep on walking till the sun comes up. I keep on walking till the sun comes up. I keep on walking till the sun comes up. That was in 2005. And that song, up to that point, we'd done low, you know, there were songs actually which ended up on Scout for Girls records which were written when we were younger. Mm -hmm. A couple which was written when we were like super young, when we were like teenagers. But that was the one where we'd been playing sort of kind of sort of rock, indie rock music up till that point. And yeah. it got to a point where I just thought we're never going to, if we're ever going to do anything, we need to make more melodic music, more indie melodic music, like bands like The Thrills and The Magic Numbers had come out. Your know, Arctic Monkeys had been out as well. Uh, Kaisers, it was, you know, it was that whole surge of bands which happened around then. And we thought uh, there was ever going to be a chance of us making it. I thought we needed to make some more like melodic harmony led music. So I wrote Keep On Walking. The rest of the guys didn't want to do it. So I just put it out myself and started Scout for Girls kind of as a solo project. Okay. Uh, and then that, you know, having sent off thousands of demos before in the 10, 12 years we've been before, I sent off about 30 demos and pretty much every single person came back to me on that song going, we love it. When can we see you play? What other songs have you got? And at that point, I didn't have a live show. I didn't have any other songs. Uh, so it kind of grew slowly from 2005. You then go on to write She's So Lovely, Heartbeat, all of those for the first album. Do you yeah. know when you're writing those that they're going to be a hit? Does something click? And you, you know, when you're writing a song like This Ain't a Love Song, one of the bigger hits that you've had, is there a moment when you think this is going to take off or do you never know that it's going to be massive? You, I, I generally think, I, when I'm writing, I generally feel uh, that every song I'm writing is, is a number one hit it's the most incredible song. It's like, this one's gonna stream like 200 million streams. When you start, and that's what makes it so exciting because like every, you know, it's, I do a job where it's kind of like buying a lottery ticket every day. Like the odds of it being a hit are minimal, but there is a chance that this song which you make, which just comes from magic from, don't know where it comes from, it, you know, could be, could be enormous. For She's So Lovely and Elvis Ain't Dead and Heartbeat, no, I had no idea because I wasn't in the music industry at that time, you know, I didn't know a single person in the industry. These were just demos we were doing for fun. Uh, I knew people were singing along to them, people liked them, but I had no idea what a hit record was. Mm -hmm. But this ain't a love song was different because that was written after the first record where suddenly I'd had like, people were calling me like a hit songwriter and, you know, we'd had so much success. Suddenly there's a load of pressure on. This ain't a love song. Interestingly, that song nobody thought was a hit. It was supposed to be like a setup for the for the album. And Famous, which was the single which came out afterwards, which uh, most people would be going, what? What's that one? <laughs> and that was supposed to be the big hit. Well, you know, the label like, that's the number one. Uh, this Ain't Love song came out of no promotion, went to number one for two weeks. Famous came out with 
absolute bag loads of promotion, really expensive video, and went to number 37 for a week and then never darkened the, <laughs> the charts ever again. So you just never know. You never know. So you guys are going on tour around the UK later this year. I know it was planned for last year and you're going to do lots and lots and lots of gigs back then, but obviously it's been moved now. Yeah, it was. It started off as a little tour after we did an album in 2019 called The Trouble With Boys and the tour was amazing. And a promoter, uh, our agent came up and said, do you fancy doing like a little B tour, he called it, of just smaller sized venues, but places you've never been to before? Because I think you could do a similar show and just see people, you know, Scout for Girls is one of those bands, like we have hardcore about 15, 20,000 people who love to come every time. And then the rest of the, our tickets, we sell like 40 or 50,000 on a tour, are people who just like, oh yeah, I know she's so lovely, that looks fun, you know? And so <laughs> we, we, just cause it's a well-known thing. So, you know, we're playing places like Aylesbury and uh, I don't, you know, places I've never been to before. And uh, so that was the idea. And then obviously that tour then got put back by six months. So they, so he was like, do you fancy doing some more dates? And we're like, yeah, okay. And then it got put back like another six months. It was like, do you fancy doing any more dates? And we're like, we will play anywhere, anywhere that we do not lose money, we'll go there. We are like, I just need to get out of this house and see some people and play because our shows are really fun. Our crew are the same guys we've been with for 10, sometimes, you know, 10, 12, 13 years. You know, we've been friends since kids. It's like a big holiday to go on tour. So, uh, yeah, I can't wait. Me, it's yours. I wish it was me, it's yours. I wish it was me, it's yours. I wish it was me, it's yours. Is this going to be the biggest tour you've ever done? I th definitely in terms of length and I think in terms of tickets sold which is which is quite mad really like you know even at our height we did I suppose we did I think we did probably around the same number of people but in slightly bigger venues but we did we we dropped a couple of balls on like when we were at our highest our most successful in terms of keeping momentum and and maybe making the most of that situation, which I kind of, I don't have any regrets, but I get, looking back, having managed bands, I see where like we, we could have done, you know, better. The great benefit of not being big in many other countries other than the UK, Ireland, kind of Germany and Holland is, you know, I have a great work-life balance. I've got two kids who I, you know, have watched, been there a lot for their growing up. I'm listening, I'm reading, well, listening to Phil Collins' autobiography, which is incredible for the stories. You know, he, and he was an absolute beast workaholic. He was doing like, he'd do a solo album, a Genesis album, like this is in one year, in like 84, like four world tours. Plus he produced an Eric Clapton album and he produced the album for the girl from Abbott. Like, like that is why he's, you know, divorced three times. And, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, We've been able to keep quite a good balance. Yeah, and that transitions really well with the Phil Collins reference to your new album. So mm. easy cover. Is it a mixture of, of new tracks and of covers? Is that right? Yeah, sort of. It, it started off as just an EP of 80s covers, which I started and tried to make quite cool. And Greg and Pete were just like, this is rubbish. This is rubbish. And so we went back and just turned them into like indie band versions of like fantastic 80s songs like everybody wants to reel the world yeah. easy lover which is hence the name easy lover uh easy cover which nobody seems to get girls just want to have fun end of the world as we know i did a couple of own songs like we did a song called i wish it was 1989 which is a big fun sort of scouting pop song and I wish it was I'm now thinking 90s, like this is classic scouting for girls. We are doing an 80s cover album when the 90s, which is like my era of music, is really 
fashionable. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're like, we're still 10 years behind. We're not even 10 years behind, we're like 40 bloody years behind. So, so I'm thinking of doing, I might start, I, oh, I've actually already started doing some sort of solo stripped back 90s versions of like Oasis and Blur and That's some cool. of those amazing songs. I'd love but to. I, Oh, well, that, that will be coming at some point. But, I was, you know, we had this discussion with my manager. He's like, oh, because they, they stream really well covers. And he's like, oh, I think we should do like another 80s or another 90s. And I'm like, let's just do an original. Let's just remember that like, <laughs> we can write some songs ourselves. So, yeah, but it's, it's good fun. I'm like in such a, I'm such a like good place musically now. Like, I just love being in the studio. I'm working with another couple of young bands producing them. I'm you know, I just feel like so energized by music and the history of music and the past. And like, I'm like going mad over vinyl at the moment. I just, uh, you know, really passionate about it, which is like when you work, you know, it's like if you work, live in a, work in a sweet shop, you know, you go off sweets. And I think for a while I'd lost that magic feeling that you can get with music. And I'm just at the moment, I'm just, so in love with it. I just wake up every day, just can't wait to get to the studio.